Well, I think there's still a bit of water to flow under the bridge. I think the discussions were fruitful in the sense that a lot of progress were made, was made. Um, a lot of detail has been worked out and uh, we made a lot of progress in that regard this week. So when it comes to governance structures, the overall principle is that we want to be provide fair opportunities to all members uh, based on merit rather than necessarily on, on membership status. Um, so the detail that we're working through is, you know, who sits on the committees? What is the committee's structure? Uh, how will the committees report into the board? Um, who will sit on the board? Um, and what will the voting rights be? Will it be, will the associate members retain the current position where they don't really get an effective vote or will they have an equal vote? Uh, how will decisions be passed? Will it be by a simple majority or by a two-thirds majority? This is the kind of detail that is being worked through at the moment. And hopefully, um, uh, before the October meetings, uh, the working group or the steering group that is charged with looking at all that detail will have had another opportunity to meet so that by October we're pretty confident that we could have a constitution before the board that hopefully they'll be able to sign off on. Well I think the, the encouraging thing again there's a lot of work to be still to be done on the detail but the encouraging thing is that all members seem to acknowledge that uh, something needs to be done that we need to put in place more meaningful cricket competition structures and again, they, get, they should be based on providing all members a fair opportunity to progress to the highest level. Um, it's impossible for everyone to play against everyone in a first division of, of, of test cricket. It's just impossible for India to play everyone uh, like people are expecting in the past. So we're we working through the detail. Do we need two divisions? If we do need two divisions, how many in each division? as far as Test Cricket is concerned. What will the ODI Cricket League structure look like? What will a T20 structure league look like if we have one? So this, this is all detail that, uh, and then once we get we almost agree the principles, we then have to say, well, will that work? Does it fit in the calendar? Will it fit with the World T20 uh, domestic competitions that are springing up all over the place? Because we don't necessarily want to be competing with ourselves. Uh, and then the third element is the funding of it all. It's no good saying we're going to have a second division of test cricket and then find that those test series are uneconomical and everyone loses money and uh, we're worse off than before. So we need to work and see if, if we, we need to prepare the calendars, make sure that the various options that are being discussed, which one fits in best. And then secondly, we need to find a, a model, a funding model that uh, ensures that no one is worse off than before. So we need to do a lot of evaluations on the different structures. Uh, it's sometimes difficult, but I'm sure that we've got enough expertise to determine the value of these different competition structures that people are talking about. So to progress the detail, again, we would like to make progress um, so that come the October meetings, we can uh, make some firmer decisions. Um, and to that end, we, the members are going to get together again, probably more like in September, once we've worked out the detail and put some indicative calendars together um, and come together whether it's the chief executives and their chairman uh, that will depend on the members but essentially it's the members it's bilateral cricket we're talking about the members need to determine uh, what they think will provide more value more context um, better value for the fans it came up for discussion i think in principle the the board supported uh, the possibility of at least holding a further World T20, additional World T20, at least in 2018. There is a gap in the calendar, the FTP calendar, for it to take place. But again, it depends on whether it's uh, worth it or not. We have got a broadcast agreement in place with STAR, and they need to be consulted. Their views need to be sought. And after all, uh, we need to negotiate a, a, a value for that tournament. So again, uh, unfortunately, we would love to have made a decision this time, but we're not ready yet. We need to work through the detail with STAR and then make a decision probably uh, in October as well. Well, the, the potential uh, for growth in women's cricket is, is, is huge. And uh, ICC has made a lot of uh, progress over the last three, four years in developing cricket, raising the profile of women's cricket. They play in a World T20 together with the men. They have their own World Cup. And the, and the Commonwealth Games really provides an additional opportunity 
to showcase the women's game, showcase the progress that has been made as far as the uh, skills are concerned, um, the, improving, the improvement in quality of a number of teams. It's not just England and Australia that are good these days. You know, you've got five, six, seven teams that can compete with each other at that highest level. And the Commonwealth Games has a high profile um, and it will be one way of uh, increasing or globalizing the sport even further, whilst in addition providing opportunities for our top women cricketers uh, to compete uh, at the highest level. So DRS has been around since I think 2011. And you know, when it was first introduced, it, uh, the, uh, the ball tracking technology was in most people's eyes good. Um, but since then it's got even better and it's we knew that it was far more accurate than people were or the doubters were giving it credit for um, so we've undertaken uh, some research with MIT uh, they've not only looked at ball tracking technologies they've also looked at edge detection technologies and the report is very encouraging the report shows that actually the ball tracking is even more accurate than we perhaps gave it credit for and for that reason, we are able to safely reduce the margin of uncertainty, we used to call it, or the umpire's call, as you've referred to it. And, uh, you know, Ian Botham and these experts were always saying, how can that be given not out? That ball was crashing into leg stump. But because the middle of the ball was just marginally one millimeter to the right of, of the middle stump, or of the center of the stump, then the umpire's decision wasn't reversed. So what we've done really is just made that margin of uncertainty slightly bigger. It's now the middle of the ball must be in line with the stumps, the outside of the stumps, which means that a ball, half of the ball hitting the stump is going to be uh, given out in the future. Um, that's the simple change. Moving forward, we probably need to uh, take heed of what the Cricket Committee is saying, take heed of what the Chief Executives Committee is saying, which is ICC should take more control over DRS, try and, uh, so the implications of that need to be worked out now, what is going to cost, what it will take for ICC to take more control, do we need to buy technologies, rent technologies, etc. And then hopefully we will be able to implement down the line a more consistent form of, of DRS. Wherever it is used, it should be the same so that the players understand it, the uh, umpires understand it of course, and the fans as well. Well that, that, that's what I'm allu uh, alluding to. The, so. Ideally, the Cricket Committee was in very much in favour of if we're going to have DRS, it should be consistently applied. And uh, I think once we get in a system which everyone trusts, then I think we are much closer to having a system which uh, all teams will accept. You know, I don't think people realise actually how difficult it is to call a no ball. I think when I was a, a youngster, I got injured and I had to umpire in a tournament. And the hardest part of umpiring was calling the no ball. As you see the foot land, you think I better call, and by then it's too late, the batsman's played the shot. It's much harder than you think. Sometimes the bowler's foot lands in front of, the, of his body and you can't actually see where it's landed. So, and unfortunately in this day and age with television, you know, cameras from the side, behind, the bowler just has to be behind the line by one millimeter and the umpire calls no ball and there's trouble, especially if there's a dismissal or vice versa. He doesn't call a no ball and uh, uh, the batsman is dismissed and TV replay showed to be one millimeter over the line. And the, the bowler never just lands, he lands and slips forward. So it's very difficult. So uh, I must say my attitude has always been, does it really matter? You know, uh, we, technology is not going to get every single decision 100% right, but uh, there, is a, there are occasions where it does influence the match. A batsman is given out, uh, or a batsman is dismissed, the umpire is called no ball, and it turns out to be not a no ball. Now that's a dilemma, because uh, you can't reverse the, the call of no ball, it's too late. You know, he might have skied a ball into the sky, the, uh, the fielder has heard no ball called, and the, the fielder stops going for the catch. So. What we've looked at now is saying to the third umpire, okay, let's see if, if you can call the, the, the no ball. It might be easier for you sitting in a box with a replay from a camera square onto the wicket. And we're looking at technology which can uh, allow the third umpire to freeze the, 
picture as the bowler lands. And then he can make this decision through a buzzer or some other form of uh, notification, advise the on-field umpire uh, almost immediately, and he can call the no ball from there. We're going to trial that. Uh, the technology is ready to trial in a one-day series. So we just, again, need to work out the detail which series it's going to be and uh, implement it and see how it goes. So in light of some tragic incidents in, in international cricket, uh, head injuries, concussion has become more of an issue. Um, some time back, ICC did some work with the British Standards Organization and they developed some minimum requirements, minimum standards for, for cricket helmets. Um, but in, in recent times now, the, you know, some of the boards have even gone as far as to say, you know, helmets should, if you're going to bat, you should, or keep wicket, or feel close to the wicket, you should, it should be compulsory to wear helmets. At international level, I think the cricket committee and the board also felt that, hold on, you know, a player is still good enough playing at that level to decide whether he wants to wear a helmet in the first place. Uh, they are, you know, it might be that the, the risk is smaller when you're facing spin bowlers, etc. So it was decided not necessarily to make it mandatory for a uh, wicketkeeper or batsman to wear a helmet, but that if he did, then I think our duty is to make sure that he's not, uh, you know, he's not under any misapprehensions, that if he goes out to bat with the helmet on, he should be at least reasonably secure that it's going to protect him like it should. And therefore we said, if he's going to wear a helmet, um, it should, he should wear one that complies with these standards. Um, how do we uh, implement that? Um, do we tell him, hold on, you can't come into bat with that helmet, you need to go off? I think in a test match, a one day match, you can imagine the furor that that would cause. So what we'll do is just treat it like any other clothing, a piece of clothing and equipment. If it breaches the regulations, then we can impose sanctions after that. And in the case of that, if you come in to, to bat with the, with, the, with the bat that's got too many stick on it, stickers on it, uh, normally the umpire or the match referee will impose a, a warning, and then only later, if you repeat again, repeat the fence again, then uh, fines and, and sanctions come into play. As far as the Olympics are concerned, discussions are still ongoing with the IOC itself. Uh, and some of our members as well as the ICC and uh, uh, hopefully by October we'll have mo made more progress in that regard but you'll understand the IOC is extremely busy at the moment with its, uh, with its Olympics coming up in Rio so as I say hopefully by October we'll have uh, uh, something more to report in that regard. I think the whole mood of the membership has changed uh, going back to Melbourne uh, then even to the Caribbean last year, uh, a lot of the membership uh, were concerned at the changes that had been made and that they felt that too much uh, authority, too much power had been vested in two or three or three countries. So I think the progress that has been made now under the leadership of Shashank Manoha in, in addressing those decisions, reviewing those decisions, has given the members a lot of heart and I think they've taken uh, I think they, they, they've taken um, confidence from the fact that it's not just hot wind, it's not just talk, that progress is being made along these lines, that, hold on, we are implementing or, or looking at introducing structures, processes, cricket structures that will uh, provide equal and fair opportunities to all, uh, based more on merit than on you know, how much you are worth as far as a member is concerned. So I think the mood was really good and the people have gone away much happier than they were 12 months ago. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about cricket only at the highest level, but we've got 105 members and our strategy is to be more targeted in our approach. So we've identified, you know, a number of teams with either they've got the playing potential, they've got the number, they've got a cricket culture in their country. Um, and we've identified that those countries could, with proper investment, uh, improve themselves so that they are competing at the highest level. Um, and in particular, I'm referring to countries like USA and Nepal, who perhaps haven't got the, current, the structure in place that they do need to progress. And for that reason, we'll be sending uh, delegations to the US, to Nepal, to again progress uh, um, the introduction of a, a much more, a better infrastructure so that cricket in those countries who are have got the potential, um, will, um, 
you know, progress much quicker than they had done before. I think the decision to hold the annual conference in Edinburgh was a really good one. First of all, it emphasizes that we're not only talking about the full members, that there are other members out there that have got the potential to progress and uh, get even better. Um, Scotland uh, has never hosted an ICC conference, or in fact, has never hosted any kind of ICC meeting before. There's been a few tournaments, but uh, none of the, they've never hosted administrators. And I think, just looking around, everyone seemed to thoroughly enjoy uh, their trip to Edinburgh, very historical city. Um, uh, people who perhaps uh, weren't whiskey drinkers, a few have been converted. Uh, but, you know, they went out of their way, Scotland. They were tremendous. They, the, the parliament welcomed us. We went to the castle. Not many people can say they've had a special function, looked at the crown jewels, had a function with the Lord Provost. Um, so we were very fortunate. And then finished off with an annual dinner where a Rory Bremner was tremendous. In fact, I'm sure it sounded like Alan Lamb, Boycott, uh, Clinton. We had, we had everybody there, actually, at the function. It was probably one of the most memorable we've had. Well, what's worrying me now is that we've got a lot of work to do. We've got trips to the USA, we've got trips to Nepal. But the main projects really is to finalize now this governance review structure. Uh, hand in hand goes, with, go, uh, uh, the funding model must be reviewed together with that. And of course the cricket structures, they almost all fit together. You can't do one without the other. And it's probably those three elements all combined into one that's probably the, the focus for all the ICD staff over the next three to six months.